Well, among those advocating this policy is Professor Stephen uh, Mulroy, a former federal prosecutor and professor of law at the University of Memphis. And Professor Mulroy, it's, it's, complex, it's a complex issue, but can you briefly sum up the argument for this early release of some convicts to home confinement? Right. Well, we know that putting people in close proximity with each other is just a breeding ground for the coronavirus. Uh, this is not only the case in prisons and jails, but it's also the case that sanitary conditions are not always ideal. Medical facilities are not always as extensive as they need to be. And so for all these reasons, it makes sense for their health and ours to not have them too crowded together. So we, we want to do is we want to reduce that crowding level, and we'll do that by releasing either prisoners who are almost done with their sentence anyway, or prisoners of low-level offenses, nonviolent offenses, property theft offenses, drug possession offenses, things of that nature. Right. I want a, a reasonable argument. Uh, I want to give you some of the arguments made by, uh, for example, some of your uh, fellow former federal prosecutors, past and present. One is that even nonviolent offenders are people who have broken the law. In many cases, it could be said they're non-trustworthy. They could be a type of danger to the community. Uh, so it's not wise to release them early. What's your argument on that? Well, two things. They're not that much of a danger to the community if they've committed low-level offenses. Um, they're certainly not going to be violent. There's no reason, based on their uh, track record, that they'll commit any kind of violent offenses. And if they stay in prison and get the coronavirus and then are eventually released, they'll, they're going to be uh, a danger, more of a danger, by spreading the coronavirus. So I think, you know, we need to flatten the curve. We need to practice social distancing. You can't really practice social distancing in jail. So the, the less dangerous thing and the more fair thing, really, is to uh, release these low-level offenders. I'd also add that there's a constitutional dimension to this. The, con the court has already ruled that among the ways that you can have cruel and unusual punishments uh, in violation of the Eighth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is by forcing people to stay in a situation in which a serious communicable disease is going to spread. So you've got constitutional as well as public policy arguments for taking the less dangerous of this population and releasing them. All right, let me give you another one of the arguments against that. Even these uh, lower-level criminals, as you call them, do need it to be monitored through the probation system or through some kind of correctional offices. And the system is just not built. It's already stressed, and it's not built for this sudden release. For example, like in California, they were talking about 6,500 at one shot. Right. Well, no, there's certainly, you're certainly going to need to beef up the ability to do uh, monitoring, ankle bracelets, home uh, detention, monitoring, probation officers checking up on uh, the people. And that's certainly a challenge. You can't deny that. But you're having to choose between two bad alternatives and having to do the best you can to ramp up that infrastructure to handle the released prisoners I think is the less the least bad alternative as opposed to basically just having uh, you know a, a prison and jail epidemic on steroids by keeping those people in confined low sanitary conditions. Right. Now, let me ask you uh, now on a more of a matter of principle, that an argument that's been made I think federal prosecutors in Massachusetts put this in a letter which is that doing this simply undermines the rule of law. If there's a problem with people keeping people safe in prison from COVID-19, then that issue has to be addressed in the prison, not by uh, reversing or, or undermining sentences that were imposed in the criminal justice system. And this could present a, a difficult precedent. Every time there's a pandemic, you could argue then that's a case for opening the prison gates. Well, two responses to that. Uh, first of all, if you know, you are concerned about the practicalities of, you know, actually being able to increase the infrastructure to take care of people who are being released, then you've really got to admit that there is no practical solution. You can't, you can't build enough prison space, you know, overnight to avoid the, uh, you know, lack of social distancing and coronavirus spread that you're going to have in prisons. There is no alternative to that except to release some of the least dangerous population. And second, I think in particular, 
This argument has salience with respect to jails as opposed to prisons. Pretrial detainees have not been convicted of any crime. So there is no principled, oh, we're undermining the principle of justice argument with respect to them. They're presumed innocent until proven guilty under the law. Most of them are in jail, not because there's been a finding that they're a flight risk or a danger to the community, but simply because they can't afford cash bail, which many people say should be abolished anyway. So at least with respect to those people, the people who are presumed innocent and are there just because they can't pay for bail, there's really no abstract justice principle argument for keeping them in jail where they're going to get the coronavirus and then be released and bring it back to us. All right. Well, as we mentioned, some states in the U.S. already pursuing this policy, and perhaps it will widen as the coronavirus spreads. And we are starting to see it spread in several prison, uh, state prison systems. Professor Stephen Mulroy, thank you for joining us on I-24 News.